expertise. And so I have a question for you as we get into our next teaching and command of Jesus. Uh, speaking of celebrities, pause for a minute, maybe shout out the very first concert you ever went to. What's the very first concert you went to? Somebody shouted Black Sabbath first service. I thought, boy, there's a way to start right there. You know, it's funny. I heard heart. What are some others? Journey. Journey. Oh, that would have been a good one with your girlfriend, some slow dancing on that one. That's good, huh? <laughs> what was it? In sync. We're going back. That's good. I can go back further. I, I, I risk at sharing the first concert I went to. I risk many of you thinking I'm that old, but I grew up on a farm in Kansas, 5,000 acre farm. And spent literally 13-hour days on a tractor just going in circles or squares. And I would listen to the radio. I wouldn't pay attention to a lot of the the who sang what. So I know a lot of the lyrics and I know a lot of the songs, but I'm always surprised about who actually sang that song. A, A good example would be when I finally watched the movie Bohemian Rhapsody about Queen. I could not believe that Queen sang some of those songs that I didn't know that was Queen. Well, the very first concert I went to, we happened to be, as in like seventh grade, uh, we were on a vacation as a family. Rarely got there. I think in my lifetime, we went on two, maybe three vacations that I can even recall. So we were doing a big road trip down through Kansas, Texas, Wyoming, and came back around to the Kansas farm. But while in Texas, a big state farm was going on, a state fair was going on, and cooling the gang. You know, back in the day where they still had trumpets on the stage, and, and for whatever reason, as I was preparing this message today, the song that I just remembered, and it's like I can close my eyes and I can see those guys on stage in their white shoes doing their dances and their spins and the trumpets are going on over here, and, and maybe you've heard this song, there's a party going on right here, right? You know the song? A celebration, Right? It just, anyway, that's my first concert, but by no means was cool in the gang cool in my day. 80s music, I don't care what any of you say about your eras, you got nothing on the 80s type music, right? And so there's all kinds of great music, and there's, it fits a theme of what I'm talking about today. Stand with me. Here's the teaching or command. If you're new, we always stand at the very beginning because I always start off a message based off what Jesus says. And just out of reverence for what he teaches, let's stand. Luke 14, 15 through 24. Uh, put it into perspective. We talked about it last week. There's a big dinner, supper party going on. Jesus is having conversations with all kinds of people, and so it continues. When one of those at the table with him heard uh, him say this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Kind of a weird phrase. Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Well, Jesus replied with a story. He said, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike, they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. And still another said, I just got married. So I can't come. And the servant came back and reported this to his master. The owner of the house became angry, ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done. There's still room at supper, at the party. Well, then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and to the country the country lanes, and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. Let's pray. We'll talk about this. Lord, we love you. I ask that in these next few moments that we as your church gathered inside this building, as Michael said, that we are your temple, that your presence is here amongst us and in us. I pray that we would learn and sharpen and grow. And that as we disperse out into our circles of influence here, Lord, in a few moments, I pray that you would help us be sharper, be wiser, be more humble, be the kind of people, Lord, that you demonstrated in your life. We want to be like you. 
Thank you for teaching us and commanding us and for laying down your life for us. May you be honored in this message and how we all learn. Jesus, it's in your name I pray. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. So, to understand this, just in case it slips by, Jesus isn't just talking about a, a party where a guy RSVP'd and people RSVP'd and then didn't show. This is a prophecy, if you will, a foretelling of what is to come. That there is a great party, a great celebration prepared in all of eternity. And that God is the owner. He's the one who had the servants go out and do the inviting, call that evangelism, call it whatever you want. And that this story is about the future and about heaven and about hell. And I want to talk about it. Today's a little bit of a different style than I might typically preach. I have no points today. I want you to sit back and I pray that you would be challenged and motivated to do everything that you can in your life to make sure that you're walking towards the party. So tune in with me. I have some questions for us. Tune, tune back in and you're just talking about your first uh, concert that you went to. Think for a moment on a different perspective. What is the best meal that you've ever eaten? What's the best party? Now, I don't necessarily mean the best sinful party where, you, where did I park my car and where did this lampshade come from? I'm not referring to that party. That's not the best party in your life. What's the best non-sinful party that you've ever been to? Is it a great epic banquet, a feast? Was it a wedding? Was it a birth of a child, a birthday party, an anniversary celebration? Was it a graduation party? Thinking back and looking back in your life, the biggest, best party that you've ever been to, the best meal that you've ever had, where was that? What was it? You're in a place, a nice place, conducive to relational atmosphere and discussion. Your taste buds are delighted. And those variables all put together and you've got one great banquet. My stomach's about to growl just talking about it, right? Well, it's fascinating because the Bible speaks about eating and meals and food more than a thousand specific times from cover to cover. It's fascinating to me. Just the word feast appears around 180 times throughout the Bible. And one way of actually looking at human history, I was thinking about this week, is you can look at human history noted through Scripture from a biblical worldview just as a series of meals. God built his entire system, if I can use that term, around some food and feasting and party and celebration. So follow this series of human history. Everything went bad in the Garden of Eden at the very first meal. Our first parents, we know them as Adam and Eve had a snack without God. Started a big problem for all of us. Later on, God's people talk about the exodus a little bit and the Israelites wandering through the desert after they were released from being slaves in Egypt. God's people get together and they eat a meal called Passover. And it's where they remember that God covers their sins and passes over their life when it's time for judgment. The blood of the lamb covered them, but it's all based around a meal. This leads very well to the coming. It's a foresight of the lamb that was shed and put on the doorposts of the exodus for the Passover meal is the very lamb that dies on a cross and his blood, if you apply it to your life, accept him as Lord and Savior, it covers you. So there's a Passover on judgment. You are free to join eternity. But Jesus frequently throughout his life ate with the people and partied with the people. His very first meal that we have recorded or miracle, I guess, that he has recorded is him turning water into wine. He's at a party with a great feast, a lot of feasts and celebrations Jesus was a part of. This leads us then, as you're progressing through to the Last Supper, where Jesus sits down with a fantastic meal, a banquet, a feast, a Passover celebration, the Last Supper before his death. Ultimately, Jesus dies, he rises from death, and one of the first things he does after his resurrection is he asks some friends for food, and it's a breakfast that he has. Jesus continues in his 40 days before he ascends back up to the great party in, in eternity with his father, and in those 40 days, multiple references of eating, eating meals with people. 
And finally, if we're following human history, you've got Revelation 19. It started with a meal that went bad. God was not invited. Along the way, God invites us to the meal, and He ends in Revelation 19, where it says at the end of human history on earth, there's going to be a magnificent party, a fantastic feast, a banquet, the best meal you've ever eaten comparable to the best one so far, and the best party you've ever been to. Jesus' ultimate kingdom could be approached and viewed through the lenses of a giant kingdom celebration and party. Have you ever thought of Jesus as a partier in a good way? One of the most tragic things that I think that has happened to Christianity, to people who are Christians, it seems like too many people who give their lives to Jesus. I had a lady last week tell me, it seems like too many Christians were baptized in vinegar. They're just grouchy all the time. Or she called another group the frozen chosen. They just don't like to have any fun. What's happened to Christianity that we've removed party and celebration from our lifestyle? And some would say, well, we, want to, we don't want to be known as gluttons and we don't want to be drunkards and we just don't want to be pleasure seekers in the world. And I would push back on that answer and say, well, we want to be worshipers. I didn't get any heat from this after the first service. I'll say it again. I promise you, you go out and you get together with a great group of people in a circle Whether it's a large group or a smaller group, I'm convinced the number between six and eight is just a perfect number to engage everybody and talk. You add a simple glass, a Cabernet, a nice wine. I call that creation in a glass. And I can enjoy that without crossing the line into drunkenness, and I can celebrate that creation in a glass. And when I drink it, I go, oh, there is a God. Or if I can push your buttons a little bit more, there is something happens when I get together with a group of three to eight guys, and we all enjoy and celebrate with a cigar together. It takes an hour to smoke a cigar, and it takes a a lot of conversation and intimacy and connection. Something magical just happens when we get together and have one of those. I call that creation in a stick. It's a smoke offering up to the Lord. You ever read about those in the Old Testament? Am I pushing your buttons? Were were, were you baptized in vinegar? Do you really believe those things are wrong? It's fascinating what has happened in Christianity. We are called to have everything in moderation. The Bible says everything's permissible, but not everything's beneficial. And we have a clear guideline on Scripture of thou shalt nots. And we must honor those. But we've taken it so far where it seems like if Christians have fun, it's sinful. And we're being nothing like Jesus. What was it back in Jesus' day that when he walked into a crowd, I'll just use this term, the sinners, the ones who were clearly living outside of God's will, they ran to Jesus without an ounce or fear of judgment. And the people of the church in Jesus' day They thought Jesus was a sinner and he was evil because he gathered with people like that. He hung out with prostitutes. He hung out with tax collectors. He changed water into wine at the end of the party. What has happened? Who has changed? Because the scriptures tell me that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And today, if we're not careful, if we took a microphone and a camera out into the world, we started interviewing people who are like the ones that used to run to Jesus without fear of judgment. And we start talking to them and we'd say, hey, give us some descriptor words, some adjectives of Christians. Would partiers, celebrators, such incredibly joyful people, some of the most creative, would those words even come out of their mouth? And what has happened today is that people who are far from God are running from Jesus. They don't want to have anything to do with Him. And church people are running to Jesus. We've flipped it. What has changed? Jesus hasn't. So I want to talk about this grand celebration. And I want you to pause and I want you to soak in for a minute how merciful, how kind, how graceful God is. That we should have such a joy and celebration and enthusiasm. We should get together regularly, not just when it's holidays, not just on Sundays, not just in our life groups that meet during the week, but times where it's not even church-related, and we just celebrate, and we feast, and we party in anticipation and preparation for an eternal party 
that's coming for each and every person who walks to the party, who RSVPs and doesn't come up with an excuse, but shows up for the celebration. As we stood and read that passage that we just read, did you notice the guy that caused the awkward moment? There's always a religious guy in a party gathering that breaks what's already awkward, and he makes it even more awkward. And he shouts out, blessed is everyone who's going to eat at the kingdom of God. And what he says is, yeah, Jesus, I hear what you're talking about in that final party. That's going to be awesome, and we're all so glad to be going to the party in heaven. And Jesus steps up and says, you're not all going. I mean, he's the judge. He knows This had to be an even more awkward moment in the party. This is the best party you're ever going to get, God says. Jesus says to the the, the people at the supper. I've said that several times to people who just say, I don't believe in Jesus, don't want to have anything to do with them. And I I step up and say to them, buddy, eat, drink, and be merry. This is going to be the greatest party you're ever going to have in life. And I would encourage you to enjoy it because eternity's coming. Eternity's coming. This is the best party you're ever going to get, Jesus says. Not all of you are going to be at my party, he says. Man, it's tragic to me. I'm almost three decades, 30 years into full-time ministry. And I visit churches. I talk to a lot of pastor friends, got a lot of circles of guys that are leading in churches. I listen to messages during the week. I'm studying and learning all the time. What's What's the temperature out there? What's going on in the church? Man, I just don't hear messages anymore about people stepping up and just throwing out a warning. Hey, everybody, not everybody's getting into heaven. I know we live in a culture today where nobody wants to face judgment. Nobody wants to face consequences. And I'm not a fear tactics preacher, but we must deal with this truth. This is something that Jesus said, so we must also talk about it. You're not all going, Jesus says to this group. Enjoy it now. The eating of the bread in the kingdom of heaven will not be yours. It's fascinating, as as this may sound weird to you, one of my favorite things to do in ministry, in church world, one of my favorite things to do is a funeral. I I just was like, uh, you remember in high school, we're going back to high school a lot, looking back at memories, where you had to take one of those tests that said, this is what you should be as a profession. Anybody have to do that? We all had to do that, didn't we? I was so angry because I wasn't a believer yet. And it said that I need to be a, uh, uh, a funeral director. And I was like, whoa, I had some choice words. Are they thinking about? I'm going into sports medicine. I'm going to go do this and that. Funeral director. Ugh! And it's fascinating as I've gotten older and I look back and how I've ended up in ministry. I absolutely love a funeral. I love science. I love the human body and how God designed it. That darn test was probably right. One of my favorite things is a funeral, because when I do a wedding, nobody wants to talk about God. Everybody wants to talk about having sex, the honeymoon, getting drunk and partying and dancing. Again, great party. But man, a funeral, when people show up, there's such a gentleness and a calmness. There's an openness. People are humble. They come in and they put all of their attitude at check and they're listening with an open heart. It's really a special thing that I love to do, but it never fails in every 100% of the funerals that I do. Well, it's some guy will blurt out or somebody will say, because I always give people a chance to talk and we share stories. Well, so-and-so, you know, they're good now. They're eating bread in the kingdom of God. They went to heaven. They're in a better place. They're at rest. They're with the Lord now. Well, not everybody is. Not everybody is. Some people die. Some people go to hell. And it's just a terrible thing. Not everybody's getting to the party. I'm actually talking with one of my sons right now as he is is pursuing the medical world. And he's around a field of people that believe a lot in science and not so much in spiritual things. And so he's getting a heavy dose and he meets some wonderful, wonderful people who are really far outside of any kind of a belief in God at all. And he talks about how wonderful and kind they are. They're living in life and lifestyles that wouldn't be backed up or approved in Scripture for eternity's sake. And, and he's talking to these people are wonderful people, Dad. And he, and he grew up in the church. 
So he knows the, the crap I get to deal with on a regular basis. He hears it as a kid. People walk up and said, I was, I was checking out your son's Facebook page, and I just want you to know I approve it. He's a pastor's kid, and he's behaving in an appropriate way. And this preacher just wants to punch him in the nose. Now confess. I'll just bust you in the nose when you do that. And, and Riley will say, Christians, God, Dad. You're telling me that they're going to heaven and that my friends who are so wonderful and kind and non-judgmental, they're going to hell? And it's just something we're talking through right now, and he knows what the Scripture says, but his heart is screaming at him. And my answer back to him frequently is, uh, I think both are going to hell, right? Somebody, just because they're sitting in church, somebody comes up and throws that judgmental crap like that and talks about you're approved in your Facebook life for their approval now to attend our church. I say, you think that person's going to, you think that person's anything like Jesus? And, and I said, and the person that you think is so kind and nice, they're not going through Jesus. It's what the scripture says. And whether we like it or not, some people are going to heaven and some people are going to hell. But what I want you to understand, God doesn't send anybody to heaven and he doesn't send anybody to hell. He's not that kind of a God. He's a just God, and it's simply this way. When you and I choose to bring heaven on earth, and we say, Jesus, you are king, boss, Lord, savior, whatever you want to say, and then we pursue him the rest of our life, and we have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness that's coming out of our lives, even in our imperfection. And when we recognize we sin and screw up and we've gone against God's ways, we're the first to get on our knees and say, I'm imperfect, forgive me. I want to repent. God doesn't send you to heaven when you die. He simply says, you chose to live in the elements of heaven on earth. Forgiveness, humility, love, kindness, boldness, courage, holiness. I just extend your life choices into eternity. He didn't send you there. You sent yourself there through your lifestyle choices. And for those who chose on earth to live in bitterness, unbelief, I don't accept Christ as Lord and Savior. Some throw in revenge. Some even throw in kindness, but it's just not through the blood of Christ. And they choose to live for self. And, and God doesn't send them to hell. He just simply says, these are your life choices. I'm a just God of integrity, and I am full of mercy too. But I do have boundaries. I don't send you to hell. I just extend your life choices into eternity. And it says there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth there. The Bible's clear. Not everybody enters the eternal celebration and party. So Jesus tells us in this parable, which is a little story that teaches a big idea. And he says that God is glorious. He's good. He's the host. He's picking up the tab. And he's generous with the menu and the guest list. And he sends out two invitations. And in that day, you would send out two invitations to a big dinner party. It happens a lot like weddings today. You know, you send out an RSVP who's coming, and then another invitation shows up, and then you got to actually show to the wedding, but you RSVP first. That's right out of a Hebrew culture. Same thing, it's just human nature. The first would simply be an RSVP. You'd have to get a rough idea of how many guests are coming to my party. Back in the day, they didn't have Costco. They didn't have electricity and all these fancy kitchens. It could take a week, sometimes more, to prepare for a big feast that has been RSVP'd to. And then once the RSVPs were received, the butchering of the animals, the preparation of the meal, the setting up of where the party's going to be, it would be done. And now you've got the guest list. Everybody's invited. They've RSVP'd. Now you send out a servant who goes out again to those who have RSVP'd. And he says, the meal's now ready. Please go get dressed and prepared. This evening is the great party. And it says, according to the story with Jesus, that many who had RSVP'd came up with lame excuses and said they couldn't attend after RSVP. And I think Jesus' point of the story is this, to show that this is what's happening in our world today. Many have RSVP'd. Yes, I believe in Jesus. Yes, I want to go to heaven. Yes, I want my sins forgiven. Yes, I want to be a Christian. But ultimately, when it comes time to make the final official response to show up, the one deep, the response that's deep in the heart and the soul, the one that is a life-changing commitment, not just a moment, not just a prayer, not just a raising of a hand, but a serious commitment, 
a lifetime choice, people come up with lame excuses. And Jesus gives some examples in this parable of lame. One guy says, well, I just bought a field. I can't go to the party because I need to go inspect it. Well, I've lived in Fountain Hills for three years now. And the biggest profession of people that I've come across would be who? Anybody ask, what's the biggest profession of people around here that, that we know of? I think realtor as well. I've met, I swear, thousands of realtors. I don't know how you all make it when you're competing against each other. There's a ton of realtors in Fountain Hills. How many of you or how many times have I bought realty sight unseen, bought property sight unseen? We don't do that. I've just bought some property, Jesus. I got to go inspect it. Really? And that day, real estate was negotiated over long periods of time, the, the swapping of sandals, the grasping of a hand inside the thigh. That's how they signed contracts back in the day, very weird certain things. And that property would have belonged to a family for generation after generation after generation. You didn't write up a contract for real estate without a long, complicated, arduous negotiation. And you knew exactly what you were buying because you had to fix a price onto it. That's a lame excuse, Jesus says. Another guy says, well, I just bought a whole bunch of oxen. Man, those are expensive. They're beasts of burden back in that day. I told you I grew up on a farm buying oxen back in the Bible time. It'd be like my dad today buying a, a giant truck, a combine, a backhoe. These things cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. You don't buy them, pay for them, and then take them out for a test drive later. Jesus says, lame excuse for skipping the party. And the third one's probably the lamest of them all. A guy says, oh, I can't come. I have a wife. Now, a lot of us understand, we, we who have married strong wives, that many times we have to say yes, dear, on a lot of things, just out of sheer fear. Is that just me? I'm just kidding. <clears throat> I'm married up. But on this one, really? Because wives hate to get dressed up, right? They hate to go to free parties where they have great food. They hate this kind of thing. This excuse is just absolutely dreadful. Wives hate this stuff, right? They'd rather just sit home and watch TV and eat foods that end in like Eatos, Doritos, Cheetos, Taquitos. Come on, Jesus says, lame excuse. This is a parable of lame excuses. And here's our reality. Here's the big idea. An invitation has gone out to all of us, you and me. You get invited to Jesus' party. You've been invited. Jesus is right now preparing the best party in all of world history. He is planning and preparing the party to end all parties. It's a feast. It's a resurrection. It's celebrating the conquering of Satan. This feast and celebration is going to party about sin has been conquered. Death has been defeated. Hell has been beaten. And it is capped Death, burial, and resurrection did it all. And the one who died, buried, and resurrected is going to be at the party in person. All are invited. All are welcome to come. But how many of you, really, you're not moving towards the kingdom. You're not moving towards the party. And you got a, you got a lame excuse. I say that out of love. It's a fair question that Jesus is asking here. Well, now, I'm not sure about Jesus. I'm really busy working. I'm in college now. It's not a good season for me. You know, I'm busy with my job. I have a lot of hobbies. I need to play more. I'm awfully stressed. I'm trying to catch up on all my Netflix shows. I can't wait for Stranger Things season four, right? Come on. Netflix is just what I need on Sundays. Life is filled with lame excuses, and we all have been guilty of the lame excuses. I'm working on my car. I'm working on my house. Uh, oh, we got kids now. I'm distracted. I'm single. These are my selfish years. I'm going to live it up for a little while. I'm not quite yet ready to get serious. Oh, our kids are grown. We have freedom again. We're going to go travel a lot more. Lame excuse after lame excuse, Jesus might say. And we say, I'd like to be a Christian. And Jesus says, all right then, come. Thanks for the RSVP. I can't make it. I'm busy right now. And all of us or these kinds of people tend to assume something. Well, because I raised my hand for Jesus. 
or because I went from point B to point A at whatever some people who were baptized in vinegar call the altar. What the heck's the altar? It's the word altar. This is the altar. Not that. Oh, we, oh, I just I fought Christians. You can see my anger. I know you can. I just want to punch people in the nose sometimes. I'm sorry. I'm so grateful I have self-control. I confess too much. We say around here, and, and I had a lady come in this morning, so I'm just going to be real here, but I'm going to behave in my wording. She walked up, and I said, hey, so-and-so, how you doing? Oh, I'm good. Yeah, things are really good. It was so clear she's lying. And it's not lying to be evil. She just didn't want to throw up on me, I guess. And I walked up and I said, I would rather you walk by. And I said the real word and just say that you're doing really crappy, except I didn't say crappy. Because our, our mission around here is one real passion. And those three words make up three little phrases. Each one matters. Every one of us matter. Be real is the center of our mission. Be real. Do not be fake. You're not welcome in this church as a fake person. Go be fake somewhere else, and I say that out of love, because fakeness gets nothing done. And the last one is follow the passion of Jesus. And I said, I would much rather you walk up here when I say, how you doing? And you say, I'm doing really terrible. And then we'll sit and have a talk, and we had a talk anyway, and it turned out so great. Please be real. Don't be a faker. It just isn't going to work. You won't get into the party at the end if you keep being fake. All of us, if we're not careful, we raise our hands and we say, I went to church as a kid. I got baptized as an infant. That didn't even happen in the Bible. I cried at camp. I came forward for the altar call. With my grandma, I accepted Jesus. She was standing right next to me. I raised my hand. I'm fine. I'm going to make it in the kingdom. And that's the presumption of this religious guy sitting at supper with Jesus when he says, not all of you are going to make it. Jesus says, no, no. It's not a one-time decision. It's a lifetime pursuit. And you can do it imperfectly. We're going to all do it imperfectly. It's like a marriage in that way. You don't just one day walk up to the altar and say, I do till death do us part. And then you stop pursuing that relationship for the rest of your life. Ultimately, that's not a marriage and it will not last. A marriage begins in the moment of the I do and it continues and grows in a lifetime pursuit. And our, right, our relationship with God is likened to a, to a marriage right there in the scriptures. He is called the bridegroom. We together as the body of Christ are called his bride where he loves us, we respond to him, but there's that mutual pursuit throughout the course of a lifetime until it grows and it finalizes with the wedding supper of the Lamb of God. The big feast, read about it in Revelation 19. Read out those last three chapters of the Bible. It's beautiful talking about, with detail and description, what the eternal celebration and party is going to be like, what it looks like, what it sounds like. So, I think we all have to look in the mirror right now. What's your lame excuse? Trent, what's your lame excuse? What's keeping me from moving towards Jesus? What lame excuse is getting me out of the way of getting to where I need to go? What's getting me lost or distracted? What lame excuse when you die, if you die and you're in hell, that you will suddenly realize that you've assumed it was no big deal the whole time? You were so busy doing the dishes, going to work, laboring over your GPA, trying to get pregnant, doing all you can to make sure your kids play quarterback, gets that scholarship that you forgot about God. That's the big idea of this teaching of Jesus, this command of Jesus. So a couple of questions that I have and we'll call the day. Who will attend this party? Who's going to attend the great eternal party, this great feast? Jesus says that the invitation goes out. All the nations are welcome. All the races are welcome. It's not about skin color. All the genders are welcome, male or female. It's not an issue. Income is not an issue. Intellect, whether you're smart or ignorant, is not an issue. The invitation goes out to everybody. Anybody can come to Jesus or RSVP, and anyone can come to Jesus' party. That's what the invitation says. And the invitation is exceedingly generous. Unlike so many religions, 
Some denominations, some churches under the umbrella of Christ say that you have to meet certain qualifications. I attended a church not that long ago, last month for my grandma's funeral. They would not let me take communion. I thought about having a riot on the spot. Can you tell I have anger issues? I've confessed that several times today. The invitation goes out to everyone. And those who are healthy, those who are sick, those who are blind, those who can see, those who have money, those who are poor, those who can put on fine clothes and go to the party looking killer, or those who might have to show up nearly naked, they're all welcome to RSVP and to attend the party, the kingdom party of God. So anyone who really responds to Jesus' invitation, they do raise the hand. They say, I'm a sinner. They say, uh, this is for the rest of my life, Lord. They're actually now not just RSVP. They're walking to the party, walking towards Jesus in the kingdom party, repenting of sin, reading the Bible, praying, being a member of the local church, being in Christian community. Those things in and of themselves won't save you, but they're all walking towards movement, towards the party. In that day when the invitation went out, you'd have to receive the invitation, then you'd have to walk to the party. Those who just RSVP'd and said, I'm in, but didn't walk to the party, didn't get to the party. Very, very important that we walk to the party. That's the Christian life. It doesn't say you're in because you RSVP'd and you have a title that you call yourself. Those who are walking to the party are the ones who get to the party. The Bible, the big word it uses, calls it sanctification. Sanctification. Here's maybe a way to understand sancti sanctification. You raise your hand and you say, I RSVP, I belong to Jesus. And then the rest of your life, that sanctification is walking towards the party. It's maturing. It's obedience. It's pursuit of holiness. It's growth. If you're not walking towards the party, you don't get to the party. And my hope and prayer is that none of you are like the religious guy, the churchgoer at the party, at the supper, saying, well, I know I'm going to be there. Don't assume anything. This doesn't mean you have to live afraid your whole life. But the Bible says this, work out your salvation. Work out. How many of you say, I'm, I'm getting beefier, I'm putting on some muscle, but you never work out your muscle. You will never get there. Work out what is already yours, salvation. You RSVP'd. It's a free ticket. The tab's been picked up. The party is being prepared. But you got to work out. You got to get there. You got to walk. Don't just assume and presume upon the kindness of God. Keep moving towards Jesus. It's not just a decision, it's a decision that leads to a full lifestyle. Very, very important. Last question. And I mean this with all sincerity because I love you. Will you make the kingdom party. Have you turned from sin? That doesn't mean you're going to be sin free the rest of your life, but there's a difference. And I'm dealing with somebody who's very close in my life right now, uh, who is, is his family, who's living a very sinful life. And he continually says this, but I ask God for forgiveness tonight. And the next day, guess what happens? There's just no repentance. It's just like, how many of you are parents and you have the kid and they just keep doing the same thing and every night, it's just sorry, sorry, man, it doesn't work, does it? Repentance is a lifestyle change. Have you trusted in Jesus? You turn from sin, even in your imperfection. And the God, think about this, Jesus, he first created the sun and the moon and the stars from his gated community, I call it. And he breaks out of the gated community. He's told by his father to get down here. He sees what's happening. And he puts on the skin of his own creation, humbles himself. He comes down here to be poor, humiliated. He's up living in the greatest gated community and the greatest party that's ever going on. And he leaves it and he becomes poor, humiliated, mocked, opposed, disdained, falsely accused, arrested, crucified, which means in this case, because he was in it, he was murdered. And he was buried and put out of people's lives. They didn't like him. Why did he come down and do that? To extend an invitation. To give you an invitation to come to his party by paying for your debt and your sin so that you could be free to join him. And then he rose from death. 
He conquered death, came out of that grave, and now he says, there's people who, and things that are against you, but I am not one. I laid down my life for you. You have the free invitation. Don't just RSVP. Walk to my party. Walk to my party. He's the invitation. He's the inviter. He ascended then back to his gated community where it says in the scriptures that he's preparing a place for us. He's preparing a feast for you. He's getting the party ready. And he invites you to raise your hand and become a Christian, but he also asks you to pursue a life of relationship, walking towards him and his kingdom. Will you make the kingdom party? I think the biggest lame excuse is this one. And churches are beginning to say the lame excuse. Uh, I'm just doing this off the top of my head. Think with me. Jesus says, every one of you are going to have to pick up your cross and follow me. What that really is saying, every one of you are going to have to go against your feelings for the rest of your life. And your feelings cannot be your God. Jesus would say, I am your God. Pick up your feelings, acknowledge them, but do not obey them. Obey me. It's what I'm having to talk with my son. He loves so many people who are far from God, and I do too, but he's around them way more because of what he's pursuing in his profession. And I'm telling him, I'm saying, son, their feelings are saying this, but God says this. And God is the same yesterday and today and forever, and he's the ultimate judge, and he's just, and he's integrity. He's never going to go back on his word. And God would say, I killed my son in place of you. I'm just asking you to pick up your feelings and carry with me and sacrifice. And every one of us have an area in our life where we have to sacrifice what our feelings are saying for us to do. What's your cross? Pick it up and walk it. Walk to the party. Will you make the kingdom party? Let's close with this. Uh, stand with me. You know the Lord's Prayer? Let's read it out together, but I'm going to interrupt you in a spot. Just read it out with me. I always put the Lord's Prayer, and it might be my Catholic roots a little bit, but I always love to quote the Lord's Prayer in the King James Version. The these and the thous and the thys are just remarkable in this prayer. So this is the King James Version of it, but let's read it together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Stop right there. You see what he's saying? He's saying you don't have to wait to party at the ultimate party. The ultimate heaven is a party. The scripture's clear. But he's saying, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thou shalt party on earth as we do in heaven. That's bringing a little bit of heaven to earth. So when you, in the middle of the summer, give a bottle of cold water to a homeless person... I imagine that's introducing a little heaven to that person, right? And when you feed the hungry and you clothe the naked and you take care of the orphan and the widow and you give up your bicycle because you aren't riding it anymore because your butt's gotten too big and the, the, the saddle doesn't even fit. Anyway, am I just talking for myself? And you give it to a kid who doesn't have a bike? That's bringing a little heaven on earth and taking care of the orphan and the widow, trying our very best not to cuss people out or punch them in the nose. Practicing self-control, that's bringing heaven on earth. And that's walking towards the ultimate party. So let's pick it back up, back to thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Read with me. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And to close, look at this next passage. Here's a description from the party inviter himself about what he's going to do as the host of the party. This is from Jesus. Jesus says this to you, right out of Luke 12. Be dressed for service. And if you don't know what that means, make a mental note. Ephesians chapter 6. Your dressing, your attire to get ready every day to be marching towards or walking towards the party is called the armor of God. 
Why would you have to put on armor if you're just going to be some uh, prosperity preacher that says, give me a bigger boat, give me more money, I'm just going to name it and claim it? Jesus says, if you're going to be my followers, you're going to be attacked. You're going to have enemies. Families are going to divide right amongst yourself because you're a follower of mine. So put on the full armor, and that whole armor is in Ephesians chapter 6. Be dressed for service. Keep your lamps burning as though you were waiting for your master to return from the wedding feast that he's preparing. Then you will be ready to open the door and let him in the moment he arrives and knocks. When is that moment for you? When he opens the door, when, you, when he knocks and you open the door, that's where you're going to meet him, literally. That's called your death in this scenario. You're going to meet him at your death. And it's really cool. He says what he's going to do at the instant you die. And you've been dressed and are ready for service. And you've been walking imperfectly. i got to throw that in there. Nobody can be perfect in it. Part of walking to the kingdom is when you screw up getting on your knees and being the first to do it. Quick to do it. Repenting. Then you will be ready to open the door and let him in the moment he arrives and knocks. Then the servants who are ready, when you're ready, you've been dressed, you've been walking, and you've been waiting for his return. I tell you the truth, Jesus says, I myself, as what he's saying here, will seat you in heaven. And Jesus says, I'm going to put on an apron and I'm going to serve you as you sit and eat. I promise you on that day, I've gone through this scenario in my head a thousand times. I will say to Jesus, come on, Lord, because he's my best friend. Do you talk to Jesus like he's your best friend? I may say, hey, man, you've been serving me. You laid down your life. Please, will you take a sit? Can I, see, can I put on the apron? Can I serve you a meal? And you know what he's going to say to me, his best friend? He's going to say, shut up, Renner. You've preached about this a thousand times. Take a seat. I'm serving you. Welcome to the party. Man. I'm going to shake my head, and I am going to enjoy that filet mignon. You know, you vegetarians are in big trouble. You go read the original language about that day and what you're going to eat. Yeah, it gets fun. It says meat. <laughs> Don't let that get out, get out of the way. Maybe he'll give you a vegetarian. I, I need to shut up. I'm digging a hole for myself. <laughs> Let's finish reading. The servants who are ready and waiting for his return will be rewarded, and I tell you the truth. Jesus himself will seat you, put on an apron, and serve you as you sit and eat. He may come in the middle of the night, or he may come tomorrow morning at dawn. But whenever he comes, he will reward you if you didn't just RSVP, that you walk into the party. I will walk with you if you have questions. If there's things you need to talk through, confess. You can't surprise me. I've been doing this too long. Nothing would surprise me. I will never judge you. I will love you and I will challenge you at the same time. Let's keep walking to the party. Oh, what a party it's going to be. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we love you. Lord, thanks for cooling the gang and all, but I can't wait for the ultimate party. I can't wait to meet you. I am literally blown away that you're going to put on an apron and serve me and the people in this room who are dressed for service every day. You're going to serve us a meal. Thank you that you created the sun and the moon and the stars. I'm awe-inspired by that. And I don't know how you do it, but how you, who have accomplished such a tremendous thing, are so personal and friendly and kind with each and every one of us. You laid down your life for me and for everybody in this room. Help us be walking to the party. We love you, Lord. You truly are an awesome God. Jesus, it's in your name I pray. All God's people said, amen.